That's all for Storylines this week. Today's episode was produced by me, Craig Desson. A version of this documentary originally aired on CBC's The House. It was story edited by Jennifer Chevalier and AC Rowe, who is also the producer of Storylines. This show is part of the CBC Audio Document. I'm Craig Desson. Thanks for listening. This is CBC Radio 1, 990 AM, 89.3 FM in Winnipeg. Your home, your street, your neighborhood, your community, your country, your world, your news, your news that matters, news that belongs to you, your world tonight, every night. Seven days a week on CBC Radio 1. On demand on the CBC Listen app and everywhere you get your podcasts. You know the feeling of finding a really good podcast or the feeling of someone always being there, like your favorite radio show. Stream CBC Podcasts, CBC Music, and CBC Radio anytime, anywhere. Download the CBC Listen app for free. This is CBC News. At 12 o'clock, we're minus 8 in downtown Winnipeg. Good afternoon. I'm Matt Humphrey. The snow is expected to start falling any minute in Winnipeg. The city's under a snowfall warning, along with Brandon, the Red River, and Pembina Valleys, the Interlake, and Whiteshell. 10 to 20 centimeters is possible, including heavy snow and greatly reduced visibility and strong wind. In Winnipeg, the city says crews are standing by, ready to respond. CBC weather specialist Riley Lechuk will have all the details right after this newscast during the show, Radio Noon. Some people in St. James downtown and Sage Creek witnessed a Winnipeg police bust in connection to organized crime. Inspector Elton Hall heads the organized crime unit. He says three waves of high-risk search warrants were executed this morning. It's going to involve drugs, guns, uh, people, possibly human or sex trafficking. We have several arrests, over a dozen. Hall says the investigation spans three provinces. A number of arrests have been made in Ontario and B.C. Hall says many Winnipeggers had their morning disrupted by police activity. He says high-risk search warrants can involve firearms. No one was injured in the arrests. A Winnipeg woman says she only got out of an apartment fire with her cats and the clothes on her back. Fire destroyed a 113-year-old apartment block on Toronto Street near Notre Dame yesterday afternoon. 54 people are now homeless. Catherine Robichaux lives on the top floor, or lived. She was working from home when the fire alarm went off. When she looked out the door, Robichaux saw smoke pouring from the neighboring suite, and it was spreading quickly. By the time I left, my bathroom was engulfed in flames, like it had seeped into my apartment by then. So everything is gone. That building is now considered a loss, a complete and total loss. The city says the building is a total loss. We're learning more about what happened to the stolen street connections vehicle. The van that provides harm reduction services to people living on the street was taken over the weekend. RCMP received a report of a man trying to break into a vacant home in the RM of Springfield Saturday evening. Police patrolled the area and found the street connections van in a driveway in the RM of St. Clements. Officers boxed him in, but the driver rammed the police cars to get out. Then he got stuck in the snow. Police had to smash the van's window to get the man out. Investigators seized drug paraphernalia and a small quantity of methamphetamine. The 28-year-old Winnipeg man faces numerous charges. The latest snapshot of Winnipeg's downtown shows a slightly rosier picture than in years past. But it's still a struggle for some businesses. The Downtown Business Improvement Zone released its annual report today. It shows in 2023, 10 more businesses opened in the downtown than closed. Biz CEO Kate Fenske says that's good news because in 2020, double the number of businesses closed than open. 
but the biz still has some concerns. Our biggest concern is our ground floor vacancy. It is those small shops that make a neighborhood that have street level activity. Our ground floor vacancy in the downtown Winnipeg business improvement zone is still over 30%. So that's where we want to put a big focus is how can we, um, you know, attract more businesses, bring that street life. Pansky says the number of people living downtown is growing steadily. She says it's now up to 18,000 and is expected to grow to 20,000 in two years. For the first time ever, a Houthi attack on a cargo ship in the Gulf of Aden resulted in fatalities. At least two people were killed when rockets hit a Barbados-flagged bulk carrier. Surviving crew members were forced to abandon the ship. A U.S. warship and the Indian Navy are assisting in rescue efforts. The Yemen-based rebels have been targeting commercial ships in response to Israel's war on Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Nikki Haley has ended her campaign for the Republican presidential nomination. This leaves former President Donald Trump as the party's lone candidate. But at this point, he doesn't have Haley's endorsement. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. That's Haley speaking today in Charleston and South Carolina. It means the stage is set for a possible repeat of the 2020 presidential campaign, Donald Trump versus Joe Biden. The Bank of Canada is out today with its March interest rate setting and as expected, it's keeping its influential rate at 5%. This is a time when most Canadians are eager to hear that rate cuts are on the way. Peter Armstrong has your details. If you were hoping for a bit of guidance from the Bank of Canada about when borrowing costs might start to come down again, you're going to come away from this decision disappointed. The bank was quite short and to the point in saying it's going to leave rates where they are and that it's just not willing at this point to make any promises about when that may change. Sure, it says inflation pressures have eased, but it says if you look at core inflation measures or the share of CPI components that are still growing above 5%, those are high and above historic averages. So it says we're going to stay here at 5% for another cycle at least. The one line that really stood out from the statement is that the governing council is concerned about risk to the outlook and it wants to see further and sustained easing in core inflation and continue to focus on the balance between supply and demand in the economy. That's good information, but nothing specific about when borrowers can expect to get a break. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. And that's your CBC News from Winnipeg. For news anytime, you can head on over to our website, cbc.ca slash Manitoba, or you can use the CBC News app. Good afternoon, Manitoba. You're listening to Radio Noon here on CBC Radio 1, 89.3 FM, 990 AM, and everywhere on the CBC Listen app and on YouTube. Hello there, Internet. I'm Corey Funk in for Marjorie Dowhouse. Good to be with you on this Wednesday afternoon. Coming up this hour on Radio Noon, which it definitely is Radio Noon, a new bylaw in Brandon is being put to the test. After their large snowfall, the bylaw could have some residents paying up to $150 if they don't shovel their sidewalks. We're going to hear how some Brandonites feel about that. Plus, over 900 kilometers of snowmobile trails in southeast Manitoba closed way earlier than normal this year. We're going to hear what that's meant for the club that maintains them coming up. But first, Winnipeg police made more than a dozen arrests this morning. We're going to hear details of that, but also an update on this weather system ahead. Well, more snow is on its way here in Manitoba, and CBC weather specialist Riley Lechuk is in with details on that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Yeah, we're in for uh, another round of snow here in southern Manitoba. In fact, already falling uh, in places like Brandon, uh, which uh, saw that snow starting through the later part of this morning, uh, and areas to the west and south of the city of Brandon itself, uh, starting to see that snow and the wind picking up with that uh, blowing snow uh, as well through uh, parts of Westman. That will make its way further to the east and the north as we get through the day today. So uh, we do have a snowfall warning in place uh, for the Brandon region. Uh, Much of southern Manitoba, uh, St. Rose, uh, Alonza, along the uh, western side of Lake Manitoba, the Interlake, yes, the city of Winnipeg, the Red River Valley, and into uh, the eastern part of Manitoba. So 
generally 10 to 20 centimeters of snow. I think in Winnipeg itself, we're looking more at 10 by the time uh, we reach uh, the overnight period tonight. Uh, heavier pockets of snow to the west uh, and to the northeast of the city. So, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we're starting to see that snow move in uh, to uh, southern Manitoba already, uh, Winnipeg, kind of on the cusp of that. So we should start to see some of that light snow beginning to fall in the next little bit here, and that will uh, pick up and continue uh, as we get through uh, the next, uh, you know, 12 hours-ish. By the time we get into the overnight period, we start to see that tapering off. So uh, forecast modeling indicating about uh, 10 uh, to 15 centimeters through the Westman region. Uh, some pockets of heavier accumulation into the interlake. Like I said, I'm thinking about 10 centimeters, give or take a couple of centimeters for the Winnipeg region and uh, into the southeastern part of the province, northwestern Ontario, more like 5 to 10. So uh, we'll uh, time this all out for you when I come back and talk about temperatures that are a little bit more uh, closer to seasonal for this time of the year. Who knew that winter would come in March this year? Yeah, Manitoba. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Riley. You're welcome. That is our CBC weather specialist, Riley Lechuk. He'll be joining us again after 1230 for another look at your weather right now winnipeg minus 13 heading for a high today uh sorry it's Th in thompson it's minus 13 right now heading for a high of minus 10 dauphin minus 16 right now heading for a high of minus nine brandon you're minus 12 right now heading for a high of minus nine and winnipeg minus seven uh right now we're gonna be warming up today to around Zero. Well, Winnipeg police made more than a dozen arrests in Winnipeg this morning. They were made in connection to an ongoing interprovincial investigation into organized crime. Police spoke with reporters earlier this morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Elton Hall. I'm the inspector of the organized crime division, Winnipeg Police Service. Uh, so, be fairly quick. I just wanted to address the police activity here in Winnipeg this morning. Uh, members of our Winnipeg Police Organized Crime Unit. Um, we're involved in an operation this morning here in Winnipeg at approximately 5.30 a.m. As well, our operation included the Vancouver Police in British Columbia, Hamilton Police Service, Toronto Police Service, Halton Police Service, the OPP and Peel Regional in Ontario as well. Several high-risk search warrants were executed here in Winnipeg and in Ontario this morning uh, for individuals involved in organized crime. A second wave of search warrants were executed here in Winnipeg uh, around 7 a.m., which resulted in a lot of people from the general public calling in. Uh, that involved our emergency response uh, vehicle or our vehicle. And in a third wave of search warrants were just executed here in Winnipeg a short time ago. All of the uh, high-risk search warrants in Winnipeg and across Ontario and Vancouver are completed. There will be more police activity in the city today involving organized crime unit, although these will be soft targets and uh, low priority uh, targets moving forward. Uh, I just wanted to uh, brief everybody very quickly on that. There were uh, all kinds of people calling in from the community. I want to thank people in Winnipeg for uh, listening to police on scene. We did block off a lot of streets uh, across the city this morning, uh, preventing people from getting to work on time. So I just wanted to come out and say thank you very much for the uh, cooperation from everybody. Uh, this investigation is ongoing. We will be uh, busy in the city. There will be movement uh, with our unit in the city today and we are still investigating. So I won't be able to take a lot of questions, but I will try and take a couple if uh, people have questions uh, moving forward. You see several uh, search warrants are talking, a you know, dozen, more than that? More than a dozen, yeah. Can you say what the crime is before? It's involving organized crime. Is it trafficking or...? Uh, it's going to involve drugs, guns, uh, people, possibly human or sex trafficking. Do you arrest at this point? We have several arrests, over a dozen. Charges are not laid yet? Or? Not laid yet. What area of the city? Uh, all over the city. Uh, the high-risk uh, incidents involve some apartment buildings, so we had people calling in. And then uh, in St. James and in Sage Creek were the high-risk wards. Can you just explain what you mean by high-risk? Uh, it involves our tactical support unit and our emergency response vehicle, or our vehicle. Uh, they're high risk because they may involve firearms. I can't comment on that right now. Is, is this a, a investigation led by Winnipeg Police or by Winnipeg? It's led by Winnipeg Police. Was there any resistance? No resistance. Concern. Do you know the status of um, the linked cases in Ontario and in Vancouver? The status? Please. All the warrants are completed right now. Everyone that we, all of our targets are under arrest right now. Okay, and then do you, do you know outside of Winnipeg? 
Um, I'm not, I prefer not to say at this moment. But there were a number of people arrested inside. Yes, there. yeah. Can take a couple more questions? Are there any links to organizations that we know of? I can't comment on that at this time. I know you mentioned the areas of the city, but are you able to be able to force the city to rebalance the roads? Not right now. We will have a, our standard uh, press conference um, at a later date, and I'll provide all that information. We wanted to do this right now. It's just easier getting everyone together and doing it. Number two, we had a lot of people in the in a community in Winnipeg calling and asking what was going on. There's a lot of uh, people who were um, well, we weren't quiet about it this morning. Let's put it that way. So people were concerned and calling police. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Elton Hall is an inspector for the Winnipeg Police Organized Crime Division. Your local news at your fingertips. CBC News has a local news app made for your phone or tablet. So don't waste time scrolling for the local stories you want. Just download the app to get the information that matters to you, when it happens, and how you want it. Another way to get your local news. The CBC News app. Download it today. You're listening to Radio Noon here on CBC Radio 1. I'm Corey Funk, in for Marjorie Dowhouse, and still to come this hour on the show, we're going to hear about a bylaw in Brandon that could have some residents paying up to $150 if they don't shovel their sidewalks. And there is plenty of shoveling ahead for much of southern Manitoba. Uh, also just ahead, the over 900 kilometers of snowmobile trails in southeast Manitoba closed way earlier than normal this year. Uh, we're going to hear what that's meant for the club that maintains those trails coming up here on Radio Noon. But first, let's take a look at your current conditions uh, across the province right now. Brandon, you're at minus 12 right now with some snow and blowing snow. Uh, Carmen, minus 8 right now. Up in Churchill, it is minus 14, mostly cloudy right now at the airport. Dauphin, light snow and minus 16 right now. Uh, Flynn Flon at the airport, minus 14. Gillum, you're a cold spot in the province right now at minus 19, mainly sunny for you. Hot spot right now is Kleefeld at minus 4. Uh, Island Lake, you're currently at minus 14 degrees. Gretna, minus 5. Melita, minus 12 right now. Norway House, sunny. Uh, Portage, La Prairie, light snow, minus 9 for you. The Pa, uh, mainly sunny. Thompson at the airport, mainly sunny, minus 13, and Winnipeg at the Forks, minus 7. Well, there may be a snowfall warning in effect right now for much of southern Manitoba, but that has not been the case for much much of January and February, and that certainly has impacted snowmobilers. Mitch Gobey spends a lot of his time on a snowmobile each winter and is president of the Southeast Snow Riders Club. He's in charge of maintaining hundreds of kilometers of snowmobile trails in southeastern Manitoba. But this year, warm weather and not a lot of snow meant he's spent much less time riding than he'd like. The snowmobile trails in Southeast Manitoba have been closed since February 5th. I spoke with Mitch earlier this morning. Good afternoon. So how did it feel to have to close the trails this year so early? It's not a good feeling. And and tell me a little bit about what led up to that, that decision. Uh, well, the lack of snow, because we never got very much snow all winter to start with. But uh, typically on a normal winter, we, we wait till we get about a foot of snow to start grooming our trails, packing and grooming our trails. That gives us a good solid three-inch base to work with. Because there's always some some rocks and boulders and some small deadfall on the trails that that base helps cover and makes the whole trail system safer. But then once once we once we got the base established, then the snowfall throughout the year is what we work with and, and groom every every day. Uh, pardon me, once a week our whole trail system. We have uh, our club has uh, 900 and we groom 956 kilometers of trail. Per oh wow! Week. So it, yeah. we we, ha- we have the largest trail system in the province. And, and so, how much of those trails were able to even open at the beginning of the season? We we went out when we had about eight inches of snow, and we got not a very, not a very big high percentage of it. I'm I'm going to guess maybe. A 
third of it open type of thing, uh, and because I can't remember exactly now. And then uh, as the winter progressed, uh, we we were able to open the the whole thing. We did we did manage to groom our all 956 kilometers mm-hmm. one once this whole winter. But uh, that was in late January, and then in early February we had to shut down because of the rain and uh, the warm weather and everything else. Right, so snowmobile season was like, what, a week for you? Basically, uh, to have the whole system open, yeah, that's pretty much it. So I know actually uh, there's actually some snow we're expecting ahead, about 10 centimeters of snow snow or so. Uh, Any chance you would even consider opening them up again this year if we do get another big dump, or is it pretty much over? It's pretty much over. We we would have to get a foot of snow, and, and there there's no way we would take the chance of opening all of our trails because we we do go over some some rivers and stuff. And even though if we got a foot of snow, the the the, the ice has been deteriorating with with the heat, and then even in the swamps, and we do we do we do go through lots of swamp uh, bog area. The the peat the swamp itself heats up from the bottom, so it, it becomes a risk to run our machines in there. Do you remember like a winter that like this in in recent memory at all, or is this the first time you've kind of had a, a rough winter like this for for snowmobiling? It's the first time like I've been involved with the club since um, I'm trying to remember now, but I'm going to say probably about 2007, 2008, somewhere in there, because uh, I I got involved after I retired, and uh, um, I do recall a, f- a few years back we had to shut down roughly mid February because we had a, a a rainstorm in the middle of the winter and that made all the trails icy, and we didn't get uh, any snow to speak of afterwards. But this is the earliest since I've been involved that we've had to shut down. When do you usually shut down the trails? Uh, normally, normally we were normally on a normal winter we groom. Like I say, we get out there and we groom every once a week, and we normally groom around 10,000, a little over 10,000 kilometers in a winter. And this year we got just under 2,000 kilometers groomed. We typically go, again, depending on the snow conditions, but typically it's middle of March towards the end of March when we when we, when our season gets done. Right, and that 2,000 kilometers, I mean, it's kind of like that 900 and so kilometers of trail. That's like doing that a bunch of times, right, cumulatively. That's what you kind of mean by by grooming that many kilometers, yes, right? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Gotcha. Um, it, but, I mean, I, I understand there is a bit of upside to this because your your organization doesn't simply just, just groom, but you, there's also these shelters that you maintain uh, as well, right? So, um, but and this is kind of giving you at least a little bit more time to, to focus on those. Tell me about the, these shelters that you maintain. We have uh, five warm-up shelters uh, located at various spots along our trail system, and uh, they they were in need of some TLC. hadn't hadn't done anything major to them in, in a number of years, and we had already decided that uh, we we had we had put aside a budget of fifteen thousand dollars to do renovations, soft hit fascia, uh, that type of thing. You know, paint the air. Fresh paint on the interior, new new benches on the inside. In some cases, we had to change out stoves and chimneys because uh, the the ones that were in there were were getting too too old and too risk uh, driven type of thing. But uh, uh, as circumstances would have it, we we put in about seventeen hundred hours working on our shelters this winter. Uh, we started in I'm trying to remember, but I'm going to say October. Some of them are accessible before the snow gets there, and then uh, we have three that we have to be able to. We have to wait for water crossings to be frozen, swamps to be frozen before we can access them. So we have three shelters that you can't access during the summer at all. Wow! So seventeen hundred hours. You think you would have gotten all that done if it was a good snowmobiling season? <laughs> well, the uh, the uh, our vice president, our club vice president, was in charge of the project. Uh, was is is pretty driven. I mean, the, the plan was to do it. Uh, we, uh, we 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 have a dedicated group of volunteers. Uh, not a large group, but a dedicated group. And uh, we, I I think we still would have had it done, but uh, it probably would have taken a little bit longer uh, to get done. Because when we're grooming, our typical grooming shift is ten-hour shifts. Two two people in the machine in the groomer all the time. Oh wow, that's and, a lot of work. Oh yes, it is. Because you, when you're grooming, you're only traveling thirteen kilometers an hour. That's what our club policy is. Because if you go faster, the the 
what we call the drag, the, the, the actual part that does the grooming that you pull behind the, 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 I'll call it the tractor for lack of a better term, but it's a special groomer, much like they use on the ski hills and stuff. Uh, if you go faster than that, the snow that you're, you're, you're shaping the snow, and I'll give you the analogy, it's like making a snowball. You're, you're taking snow and you're, you're crunching it, working the air out of it and making it hard packed. And that's and it, basically what a groomer drag does. Are, are, how are you feeling about the, the coming years? I know, you know, generally mean El Nino has been a little bit warmer winters, things like that. Uh, what, how are you kind of planning ahead? Well, it, we're, we're hoping and praying for more snow next winter. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's all you can really do, eh? Yes, yes. Because <laughs> well, uh, in Manitoba, your 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 funding comes from from your grooming. Uh, the the provincial body, Snowman, tracks all the groomers by GPS, and you're paid for every kilometer that you're groomed. So this year, our funding is going to be down big time from what it normally is. But uh, we we plan accordingly, and we try to put money aside so that uh, we don't end up being cash poor. Makes sense. Well, uh, well, Mitch, all the best. Uh, thanks for t- chatting with us this afternoon, and uh, hopefully next winter brings much, much more snow for you. Thank you very much. Mitch Gobey is president of the Southeast Snow Riders Club. Well, if you look at the forecast, it may not feel like we're at the tail end of winter, but we are. And if you're growing tired of your standard soup recipes by now, Julie Van Rosendahl has some suggestions. Van Rosendahl is a cookbook author and a CBC Radio food columnist. And she says when it comes to soup, sometimes it's best to ditch the recipe and improvise. You can turn anything into soup. You know, you can add some stock to leftovers, you know, leftover, a bit of leftover stew or leftover curry or roasted vegetables. Takeout from your, you know, restaurant takeout, I have turned into soup. Just add some stock. Uh, and if you want to wing it, and, uh, you know, often I'll post soup on, on my Instagram and people are like, what's the recipe? I'm like, well, like, I kind of, I kind of winged it. Most start with, you know, onion, onion, celery, carrot, a, a mirepoix or a sofrito or, or onions and other items aromatics like garlic and ginger and, and spices, and then anything that you want to brown or get some color on, like mushrooms. Mushroom soup is the easiest thing in the world. You know, brown your mushrooms, add some stock, add some, you know, add a splash of sherry if you like. If you want to thicken it, you can shake some flour over top of the, the veggies or, you know, your sort of foundation before adding your liquid. And then stock or water, tomatoes, any form of tomatoes, you know, crushed or ground or whole or tomato juice. You can add beans or lentils. Lentils don't need to be pre-cooked. You can just toss them right into the pot. Uh, Beans, you do need to pre-cook them. And remember that acidity in an acidic environment will prevent them from softening. So make sure you don't, you know, try and cook your beans in a tomato-based soup. Grains, you know, you could add pasta or barley or farro or rice directly to the pot if you want the starch to add body to the soup or cook them separately. Or if you have some leftovers in the fridge, you can add that. Uh, and fragile greens, you know, spinach, some kale from your freezer, some basil, add that last just to wilt it in. A lot of people think that it, it is really important to make stock from scratch. It can be expensive. People go to great lengths and use a lot of ingredients to make stock. Sometimes I keep my veggie scraps in the freezer and, and make a batch of stock. But even water, when you have a lot of ingredients in your pot, that's how you make stock anyway. So water, most of the time, is just fine. This is... A brilliant purple soup. It's made with ube, which is a, a purple yam. It's native to Southeast Asia, very popular in Filipino cuisine. So I was going through my my fridge. I had a huge cauliflower cauliflower soup, and then I found this grated ube in my in my freezer, and it's onion, garlic, ginger, ube stock, coconut milk, pureed. You know any. Any soup can be pureed. If you have ingredients that you're not sure if it's going to work, just like throw it in a pot and puree it. All soups freeze really well. If they're potato chunks, they can go a bit grainy. But, you know, if you freeze a soup and the texture is funny, you can, again, you can puree it when you reheat it. Oh, man, now I want is just some soup. And I think I'm going to have some tonight. I think my mom is making homemade chicken noodle soup tonight, a classic, with a little bit of aniseed in it, which is a very Mennonite way of making chicken noodle soup. It's really, really good. Uh, That was Julie Van Rosendahl. She's a cookbook author and CBC Radio food columnist. If you want to see more of her recipes, you can head to dinnerwithjulie.com or cbc.ca slash mycalgary. And we want to hear about your favorite soup recipes. Something maybe you grew up with or maybe a recipe that you've kind of 
figure it out yourself just from experimenting in the kitchen, uh, share with us because it's always soup season. Let's be serious here. Summer, winter, just a good soup just hits the spot. Give us a call on our listener line, 204-788-3205. That's 204-788-3205. She couldn't stay I watched her long hair turn away The flowers are dying in her hands I heard you come back to save me I heard you come back to save me Pull me from the river in my wedding Madeline Roger, Manitoba's own Madeline Roger with Lady Luck. Well, uh, we're coming to the end of this half hour of Radio Noon, but you want to stay tuned because after the news, we're going to hear about a new bylaw in Brandon that uh, means residents could face huge fines if they don't shovel their sidewalks. And there's plenty shoveling ahead uh, with this snowfall warning in effect for much of southern Manitoba. So we'll talk more about that after your CBC Winnipeg News. This is CBC News. At 12.30, we're minus 7 with a snowfall warning in downtown Winnipeg. It's good to be with you this afternoon. I'm Matt Humphrey. Winnipeg police say more than a dozen people have been arrested in connection with organized crime spanning across three provinces. The CBC's Rosanna Hempel has your details. Police carried out a number of high-risk search warrants all over the city this morning, including in St. James and Sage Creek. Search warrants were also executed in Ontario today. Inspector Elton Hall with the Winnipeg Police Service says it's linked to organized crime involving drugs, guns and possibly human trafficking. Hall says Winnipeg Police is the lead on the investigation. They've been working with police services in Ontario, including in Hamilton and Toronto, along with Vancouver. Hall says more than a dozen people have been arrested, but no charges have been laid yet. He says Winnipeggers should expect to see more police activity across the city today, and the investigation is ongoing. He says more information will be released at a later date. Rosanna Hempel, CBC News, Winnipeg. The province's largest health care strike in more than a decade started at midnight at a Winnipeg facility which is home to people who live with physical disabilities. 160 health care support workers at 1010 Sinclair say they haven't got a fair offer from the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority. The workers are mostly health care aides represented by CUPE, Manitoba. The union says its members have seen their wages increase by less than 2% over the past seven years. Pickets went up outside the facility at 1010 Sinclair this morning. And Winnipeg's downtown biz says the core is coming back from the pandemic, but business businesses still struggle. In its downtown snapshot report, report released today, the biz says 10 more businesses opened than closed in 2023. Biz CEO Kate Fenske says it's an improvement over 2020 when they saw double the number of businesses closed than open. We're getting very close to hitting net zero. That's one of our goals for the downtown Winnipeg biz. And in Q4, we finally had the same number of businesses open uh, that closed. So we're going in the right direction, but it still shows that there's still so many challenges. The pandemic, we know, hit businesses really hard, hit the neighborhood hard downtown. Fenske says one of the biggest concerns is the ground floor business vacancies. She says that number is stubbornly high at 30%. The report found more than 18,000 people are now living downtown, and that's expected to rise to more than 20,000 in the next two years. And that's your CBC News from Winnipeg. Hey, Matt, you used to live in Vancouver, right? That's right. So what happens in Vancouver when you get uh, like 10 plus centimeters of snow? (laughs) 
Um, when it does happen, which yes. is rare, uh, <laughs> the entire city shuts down. Okay. I remember I was there once and it was snowing. I think maybe you got like two, three centimeters. I was there in December. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm trying to remember the last time there was 10 centimeters. Yeah. I, and maybe it was like two, three centimeters of snow. I remember I was there and people were playing with their umbrellas. Like, what do I do? It also doesn't stick really. But yeah. there's a lot of hills, right? So those buses can't really get <sighs> oh, up there. I guess so, eh? That, that's, tricky. that's tricky. A lot of sliding. There's this one university on the top of a mountain. So all the classes get canceled. Oh, Right. Yeah, because okay. some of the students can go up there. Just chaos. That's very funny. Cool. Not like our city, exactly. which is built for it. Exactly. Represent. There we go. That's, that's the one thing we got over BC. Take oh, that, BC one of ears. many things. <laughs> one of many Come things. Come on, the bread is better here. Okay, that that, that Winnipeg rye. Can't I'm not it. kidding. It's better here. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. Good. Thank you very Thanks, much, yeah. Matt. <laughs> that's Matt Humphrey at our CBC News Desk. And to tell us what to expect uh, for the snowfall warning we've got mm-hmm. uh, across the province is, uh, well, not right across the province, but at least the southern part, uh, is Riley Laychuk, our CBC weather specialist. Hello. So I mentioned off the top of the show that we do have a snowfall warning mm-hmm. uh, for Brandon uh, through Verdon down into the Melita Boys of Ain Delarain region. Mm-hmm. The Pemina Valley, the Red River Valley, the city of Winnipeg, into the interlake in eastern Manitoba. Uh, I, for the city of Winnipeg itself, I'm thinking about 10 centimeters uh, by the time we hit midnight or so tonight. I uh, could see some higher amounts uh, to the north of the city, uh, as well as perhaps as far west as the Brandon region, where we have seen that snow start already. And it's been snowing uh, for, for for a good couple of hours in the Brandon region. Uh, Winnipeg itself uh, just kind of on the cusp of uh, this snow at the moment, not quite seeing it yet here in downtown Winnipeg, uh, but certainly areas south of the city starting to see uh, some of that light snow. And we'll expect that to continue as uh, we get through uh, the afternoon today, that snow picking up uh, in intensity it is as it moves uh, further to the north so uh, by the time we get to about supper time we are looking at uh, the snow continuing in Winnipeg some heavier bands and it's these heavier bands of snow uh, where we could see higher accumulations even up to that 20 centimeter mark in parts of southern Manitoba as we get into the evening tonight into the overnight period we start to see the snow tapering off uh, basically in a line from southwest to northeast exiting the province around Barron's River into the Red Lake Ontario region so That's kind of the direction of travel we're looking at here. Uh, But by the time we start Thursday morning, a few lingering flurries, maybe otherwise a mainly cloudy day uh, with some sunny breaks as we get into the remainder of the day. Uh, Right now we're looking at minus 7 in Winnipeg, minus 4 in Steinbach, uh, minus 12 in Brandon, and uh, Thompson right now at minus 13 degrees. Uh, I think we have a shot at minus 1 in Winnipeg this afternoon uh, with that snow falling. Uh, A bit cooler back to the west, uh, which is on the colder side of this area of low pressure. So areas like Brandon, Melita only getting to minus 10, minus 11 this afternoon. So that gives you uh, kind of a look at where we're seeing uh, some of the warmer air uh, versus the colder air uh, in parts of the province today. Uh, minus 7 on the way for tomorrow, uh, maybe some sunny breaks in the afternoon. Minus 5 for your Friday. Uh, minus 3, a mainly sunny Saturday. And then uh, Sunday, which by the way is time change uh, to put your clocks forward. Uh, plus 1 and plus 2 on the way for Monday. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. It's coming up quick here. Exciting. Okay, well, thank you very much, Riley. No problem. That is our CBC Weather Specialist, Riley Lechuk. Twelve thirty-six right now here on Radio Noon. I'm Corey Funk in for Marjorie Dowhouse. And as you may know, Marjorie Dowhouse, actually, uh, who is the go-to host for this show, uh, hosted her last show for quite a while on uh, Friday because she went on maternity leave, and she hosted on Friday, and by. 10, 11 p.m. on Saturday, she welcomed a baby boy into the world. Lucas David Ricardo Dowhouse, welcome to the world. Uh, congratulations uh, to you there, Marge. Uh, so uh, we're all just so happy for you. I think I speak for all the CBC staff here that we are so happy for you and wish you all the best on this next wild, wonderful, beautiful chapter of your life that you're on. We're excited to have you back, but we really hope you enjoy this uh, this very unique part of your life and he is cute as a button she sent a picture and boy oh boy that is one cute little boy excited to meet him in person he's i just want to i just want to hold him he's so cute uh well 12 37 right now uh and uh, you're listening to radio noon and uh moving to uh, back to more snow snow is the big story this year but uh maybe not the kind of snow story you want to hear particularly if you live in brandon a new bylaw means the city can hand out hefty fines to people who don't shovel 
their sidewalk. The bylaw says residents can be fined up to $150 for failure to clear snow from any sidewalks close to their home, including public sidewalks. Brandon CBC reporter Chelsea Kemp spoke to Ron Bowles, the city of Brandon manager, about why this new bylaw was implemented. The bylaws are in place to, to get people to conform to what um, people want for standards. And what do they want in Brandon? And this, some of this has always been in place is that people are required when they want a home or they want a business to keep the snow clear in front of their, their mm-hmm. house so that it's safe use for uh, people that are that are going by and children going to school, people trying to get to a bus stop. So we're all required yeah. to uh, to keep the sidewalk clear in front of our house. Of course, it's a big snowfall. It's taking the city longer than um, that we'd hope to get it cleared, and it'll take people longer than they hope to get their sidewalks clear, and, and we're respectful of that. That was CBC reporter Chelsea Kemp speaking to Ron Bowles, a city of Brandon manager. But the bylaw affects more than just snow clearing. The bylaw also prohibits any loud, blasphemous noise, abusive, obscene, or shouting in a boisterous manner. That's what the bylaw says. And that uh, that could disturb the peace of another individual, is according to the bylaw. Christopher Snyder is a professor of sociology at Brandon University, and he says those changes are much more concerning. So we're chatting about the community standards bylaw. I think a lot of people have raised concerns about the snow clearing, but what kind of jumps out about it to you? I mean, I think even you know the, the snow clearing was, uh, I don't know, a distraction. I think the, the big issue with the, the bylaw concerns the some of the incredibly vague definitions of things like noise, which is now defined as any sound, which essentially means that um, police officers using their discretion can come into contact with anybody at any time, uh, almost anywhere in, within the city of Brandon, uh, in, in the streets. And that's incredibly problematic um, because it, it, discretion is largely unregulated, unmonitored, it's not controlled. So it's, it's an area where... Um, when police come into contact with people, uh, largely it would be probably unhoused people, people experiencing mental health crisis, people with addictions to drugs, some of the most vulnerable people in Brandon. Uh, you have uh, the increased possibility of the police use of force in these circumstances. So if the encounter, according to the individual police officer's discretion, does not go according to how they see it, uh, for the individual, uh, they can use force. Um, and, and that's, again, it's incredibly problematic. And I, I think because it's unregulated, un, unmonitored, that, you know, that this is something that should alarm all residents uh, of Brandon. I, I think the seems to be, for many people in this city, quite a, kind of like an other person problem, where, you know, it's it's not me, it doesn't involve me, you know, I, I, I I'm not unhoused. I'm not addicted to any sort of substances. You know, this is not me. But this can be your kids, right? Uh, listening to music. This could be anybody at any time. And we really need to sort of, I think, band together collectively and to have this bylaw uh, uh, amended and and you know with with some better better insight um, into. And maybe foresight into the the consequences that this bylaw can have on anybody and everybody uh, in in within the city limits of of Brandon. How do you start those conversations when at least when I look online or talk to people, they seem to care more about something like snow clearing. How do you kind of drive home the bigger ramifications, especially if you are someone who's unhoused? The snow clearing is relatively inconsequential. I mean, it can it can result in a fine. Putting police into contact with again uh, the most vulnerable people uh, in the city of Brandon uh, increases the likelihood of of harm, severe injury, and even death. So, I mean, this is a, a very serious and very consequential uh, amendment to this this new bylaw. Um, and and I think that's how we get people to start thinking about this. And that you know, th- this is this can be literally a matter of life and death uh, amongst the most vulnerable and marginalized people in the city of Brandon. And, and if we collectively are not looking out for these people, uh, I mean, who is, right? And, and if there is a circumstance where somebody's harmed or killed, 
uh, the blood's on all of our hands if we say nothing and do nothing about this. Um, you know, I've been trying to talk to colleagues and friends and, you know, again, many people I've spoken with uh, had not even really heard uh, about, you know, the specifics of the bylaw that, or the, the, the changing in the noise definition, which is what I think is the most problematic aspect of the bylaw. Uh, in addition to other sort of strange language like blasphemy being used, uh, blasphemous noise, I think, within the bylaw that, you know, this is, uh, you know, uh, why would this, this is sort of dated or old language that we don't use in contemporary Canada. Again, I think that's the way to sort of bring it forward is that it, it can, you know, it, it can be not just unhoused people and marginalized people. And let's say as, as horrific as this might be to say out loud, general people that, that many people might not care about, you know, this can be, so. this can be your kids. If, if your kid is making noise um, and, you know, a, a cop tells them to stop and they mouth off to the cop, which kids do, right? Teenagers, you know, they, they can be lippy. Um, then what? You know, what, what if it's your kid that, that's harmed uh, in this situation? Again, because, you know, police officers are, are emboldened with discretion. And if the circumstances, the interaction that is, don't go according to the way in which the police officer sees it uh, sort of happening, then they can, they can use force. And, you know, do, do we really want that? Do the citizens of Brandon really want that? Do they want um, force to be possibly used on people that they care about, their family members, their children? And, you know, I, I suspect the answer, I hope the answer is no. That was CBC reporter Chelsea Kemp speaking with Christopher Schneider, a professor of sociology at Brandon University. And for more on this, you can go to cbc.ca slash Manitoba. Communities in Focus is back. CBC wants to get to know the communities we serve a little better, and this time, we're coming to St. Laurent. I'm Emily Brass. Join me March 11th to 15th and share the stories of your community. Let's find out what St. Laurent is all about. Communities in Focus. Visit cbc.ca slash Manitoba slash community for more. Looking forward to that. Marcy Marcusa and I will also be doing uh, broadcasting live from St. Laurent as well as Ericsdale over the next uh, couple of weeks as well, hosting some live shows. So looking forward to uh, being out there and uh, seeing what the community, what kind of stories are out there in the community. Should be fun. Well, we have a little bit of time here on Radio Noon for some more music and off their 2016 album, Nothing But Teeth. This is The Rippers with Not The One. Yeah. 
the Rippers with Not the One. 12.48 right now, and Not the One might be something a lot of people who use dating apps might hear from uh, folks uh, pretty regularly. And if, uh, they grew up in a world with apps, but it may not mean they want to use one for dating. Recent findings about the online dating world <clears throat> show that Gen Zs are resisting the allure of dating apps. It's an unexpected upheaval from the generation raised in a digital world. So what's going on? CBC's Manjula Selvaraja went looking for answers. Our search for love is big business in the online world. The companies behind some of the most popular dating apps are now tech giants. Match, which owns Tinder and OkCupid, is worth over $9 billion. Bumble, which touts itself as the one where women make the first move, is valued at over $1 billion. But both companies took a tumble in the stock market this quarter. This could be explained by the rough economic environment in which all tech companies find themselves. But some signs point to a problem specific to the online dating scene. Is Gen Z passing up on dating apps? This is the real reason that dating apps are complete waste of time for the majority of people, and I have not seen a single person break it down like this yet. The apps suck. I absolutely hate dating apps. And it's more than rants like those from TikTok. A 2023 report from the analytics firm Statista shows that two-thirds of U.S. users on dating apps were in the 30 to 49 age group. Meanwhile, only a quarter were between 18 and 29. University and college students may also be opting out. That's according to a 2023 poll by the news outlet Axios and youth polling firm Generation Lab. 79% of the nearly 1,000 U.S. university and college students they surveyed indicated that they were not using any dating apps. I would wonder a little bit if there's some COVID fatigue going on. Adam Gallivan is an associate professor of family science in the Department of Human Ecology at the University of Alberta. Gallivan studies what leads to healthy and fulfilling relationships. From people getting sick of when they had classes online and everything, if that's contributing to potentially people wanting to kind of see people more in person. Megan Vole wonders if it's the competition from smaller targeted players. Vole is a fourth-year PhD candidate at Western University studying online dating. Her research focuses on the tensions between the makers of dating apps and their users. I think we're seeing a rise of more localized, more community-based, if that makes sense, dating apps or these micro dating apps that are that are just coming up for specific communities, specific people, specific interests. There are thousands of dating apps. Fetch a date for dog lovers, Vegly for vegans. There's even one a few computer science students at Western University launched last year called Winder, a Tinder-like app for students at the school. But Elias Abujade has doubts about if people actually join dating apps to date. Abujade is a clinical professor of psychiatry at Stanford University and the author of the book, Virtually You, The Dangerous Powers of the E-Personality. In a survey he and a research group did of more than 1,000 Tinder users, half indicated that they weren't interested in dating offline. So it begs the question of what they're doing on there. And, you know, one conclusion we had that they're treating it as another social media platform, a way to get a boost through, you know, winning, winning some sort of popularity contest in terms of, you know, the number of, of, of people approaching them. And he says the ones looking to date experience the tyranny of choice. The notion that dating apps sell us, that there's literally an infinite number of possibilities out there, will make the person less likely to want to invest effort into improving the relationship that they already have. And instead, they, they go on this sort of endless quest for a more perfect connection. Megan Vo of Western University says the abundance of choice keeps users on the app. In the way that choice operates on dating apps, there's a real scholarly line of thinking of, yes, there is such thing as choice fatigue, but in a way that it also benefits the economic objectives of, of the dating apps themselves, and it is in fact deliberate. Choice plays a role in, in keeping you online and keeping you engaged and not maybe letting you settle. Mindless scrolling, constant messaging, avoiding romance scammers, and dealing with being ghosted. Sounds like a lot of work. 
A third of more than 5,000 U.S. singles surveyed by Match.com report feeling burned out in their dating lives. This is from Match's Singles in America study in 2023. Could this herald a return to more in-person dating? Both Match and Bumble have released features with in-person events and a push to meet people offline. But it's too early to tell if we're in the midst of a dating renaissance, a dating recession, or just a meaningless blip. Meanwhile, Adam Gallivan of the University of Alberta has some advice based on his research. One of the things I worry about with dating apps is the tendency to view relationships in a very consumer sort of way. When things aren't going well, we might be like, OK, well, it's not going well, I'm going to bail. But relationships take work. No matter how good the algorithmic matchmaker is, according to Gallivan, flourishing relationships are made over time, not found. For CBC Radio, I'm Manjula Salvaraja. Twelve fifty four right now. You're listening to Radio Noon here on CBC Radio One. I'm Corey Funk in for Marjorie Dow House and got time for one more song here before we close off the show off his album Jump Back Kerouac. Here's Mike Plume with a walking home. Mike Plume with Walking Home. Well, that's a wrap for this edition of Radio Noon, but there's still uh, lots to come this afternoon on Up to Speed. 
A new database made by investigative journalists is allowing Canadians to look at government documents. On Up to Speed this afternoon, Chloe Friesen will talk with someone who's a part of that project and why it's needed and what they hope the database will do. Stay tuned for that from 3 to 6 on Up to Speed this afternoon. Big thanks to everyone who helped put together today's show. Matt Humphrey, Riley Laychuk, Abby Ariemi, Travis Peterson uh, behind the uh, YouTube controls, our tech Daniel Friesen, director Dylan Longhurst, show producer Nelly Gonzalez, senior producer of audio Leif Larson. And once again, congratulations to Marjorie Dowhouse and a big warm welcome to her beautiful new son, uh, Lucas, into the world. So uh, congratulations to you, Marge. I'm Corey Funk. In uh, for the rest of the week here for Marge, and uh, you're listening to CBC Radio One. Coming up next, Writers and Company. Have a good one. Jordan jumps to new heights. I can tell them the one thing the other companies can't compete with. Our basketball division is terrible. I do not love it. And Blackberry's boom and bust. It's called a Blackberry. Try typing with your thumbs. Biopics, when brands become movies. Who are you? I'm Alan. On Under the Influence.